Ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, a distinct honor and a pleasure to introduce to you our first special speaker of the day, Dr. Ikler Aichi, President of the Turkey Prime Ministry Investment Support and Promotion Agency. Dr. Aichi was born in Istanbul in 1971. He graduated from Bilkent University's Department of Political Science and Public Administration in 1994. He continued his academic studies as a researcher at the Political Science Department of the United Kingdom's University of Leeds in 1995. Mr. Aichi completed his master's degree in international relations at Marmara University in 1997. Uh, Mr. Aichi's uh, professional career began in 1994, holding positions at Kurtsan Pharmaceuticals Company, the Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality, and Universal Dish Tijaret Company, apologies if I'm mispronouncing everything. Following these positions, Mr. Aichi became the general manager at Bashak uh, Sigurta, Sigurta Company. Between 2005 and 2006, and uh, subsequently the general manager at Junish Insurance Company from 2006. Uh, Mr. Aichi also served as a chair and board member of various organizations, including the Association of the Insurance and Reinsurance Companies of Turkey, the Foreign Economic Relations Board, Turkish Chinese Business Council, Vakif Insurance Company, and Vakif Bank, Güneş, Sigrota Sports Club. Ladies and gentlemen, please Welcome our special speaker, Mr. Ikler Aichi. Good morning. Um, professor Darius, Professor also Prize and Professor Gorinchas and Professor Zetiar, distinguished members of the University of California, Berkeley, and my colleagues, my commercial attaché, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be here and to speak in front of such a great audience. Please allow me to thank you for your kind invitation, first of all. On behalf of the Prime Ministry Investment Support and Promotion Agency of Turkey, I'd like to say once again to welcome, and I'm sorry about my resume, and I'm sorry, Mr. Darius, I know, Professor, it's very difficult to read some Turkish words. I think we have to change some part of the, um, this, this actually uh, resume. But one of the most important change I'd like to make it, if you are giving me today the honorary just uh, PhD, so it's nice to be called as doctor in the university. I, I think I should uh, visit more often to universities to get that type of honorary doctorship. Basically, I have only a May, I'm sorry. So, <laughs> I didn't just um, I didn't just finish yet my um, PhD, but thanks to uh, Professor um, seriously Professor Zahati today just honored me with this honorary doctorship. So um, yes, like Professor Garincha said, uh, there are so many similarities between Istanbul and the beautiful city of San Francisco. Basically, I like here just because of there are a lot of waters around, like in Istanbul. So the environment is great, the coastal area is great. But basically, um, like Golden Horn, I'm an Istanbuler. I'm a person who loves uh, his city a lot. But basically, I'd like to have one more similarity. This is very vital for Turkey and Istanbul, I think. I hope one day we should have, I think one day we can have 
such a great valley, Silicon Valley, and a place for the real ecosystem for the um, actually science, technology, entrepreneurship. And, and I hope uh, we can achieve this in my country as well. So um, let me just continue with the, let me just continue with the, uh, well, first of all, the recent economic development in Turkey. Try to give you some clues about the Turkish model. Well, basically, uh, we're not presenting Turkey as a model, I have to say that. Yes, we have a tremendous success in the last decade, but we're just uh, trying to call Turkey as, as an inspirational center rather than a model to anyone. Because every country has their own historical and cultural and economic background and political and social background. I don't think that one model can be applicable totally to another country. But basically in my region, where I live in, that is Middle East, and, and I think um, it is important to cooperate and collaborate more and more in my region as well. What Turkey is trying to do is trying to share the experiences and increase the cooperation and collaboration in the region as well. So I'd like to give you some flavor about the Turkey's success in the last decade. So first of all, Turkey's recent economic development, which has been insp inspiring many countries in the world, let alone in the region. In this regard, Turkey never shunned any country which wanted to benefit from Turkey's experience. Because Turkey has always perceived a foreign policy based on cooperation, values, and friendly relations with all peaceful nations in the world. Well, distinguished participants, Turkey has never posed itself as a role model in the region, but Turkey has always shared its experience with countries which wanted to develop their economies and enhance their citizens' living standards. Turkey considers its economic success as a success for the entire region. Turkey has been relentlessly working to contribute to economic development to the region. Despite the setbacks in the region, Turkey is committed to the overall well-being of the region. Ladies and gentlemen, Turkey implemented what the economic rationale required. So what made Turkey so successful have the political will and its visionary leadership. And the political leadership which came to power in 2002 has changed Turkey's political and economic landscape. Political stability, economic development, rule of law, fiscal discipline, among others, have been the main pillars of the new political establishment in Turkey. Turkey has always stuck to economic policies which have been contributing to socioeconomic development of Turkish people. It has never yielded to populist policies. Instead, policymakers have implemented the policies which serve the public interest best, not the policies which interest the public. So, as such, these policies were implemented at the expense of the Turkish society. On the contrary, policymakers' commitment to economic development has fundamentally transformed to, transformed to the socioeconomic structure of the society, which enhancing living standards. Let me give an example. Let's back in 2002. More than 30% of the Turkish society was living on less than $4.3 per day per capita. And, but as a result of the government's dedication and determination, Turkey has been elevated out of poverty and today less than 3% of the society now uh, live on less than $4.3 per day. Such a drastic transformation has paved the way for the emergence of a middle class which has been the backbone of our economy. This transformation has been achieved through structural reforms in many areas. Over the past decades, Turkey has embarked on a comprehensive reform program. The main objectives of the structural reforms were to increase the role of the private sector in the Turkish economy and to enhance efficiency and resilience of the financial sector and to run in public finance. Turkey's economic success over the past decade is based on its staunch belief in the entrepreneurial spirit of the private sector. Therefore, it has gradually decreased the role of the government in the economy and paved the way for private sector-led economic development. To this end, it has privatized state assets and created a fair, favorable investment climate in which business flourished. So that is why over the past decades, Turkey obtained more than $50 billion privatization, as well as Turkey attracted in the last decade $125 billion foreign direct investment. 
As, as I said at the outset, the real driver of the success is the political leadership, which brought about a change in mentality. A clear indicator of this change has been allocation of public resources. For example, with the new political leadership, education has been receiving the largest share of, <coughs> out of the national budget. This is very important, ladies and gentlemen, because this indicates what Turkey has been investing in. Education of our children, who are our future. So this is very important. Instead of investing a lot, instead of investing on defense, in, instead of investing defense, just changing the uh, whole situation and, and turn upside down the whole picture and investing more on education, I think one of the most important, I think, change in the last decade in Turkey. Ladies and gentlemen, while economic reforms have continu continued in unprecedented way, Turkey has also reinforced these reforms with the rule of law. Turkey has aligned its leg leg legislation with the European Union and adopted international standards. Let me give an example how Turkey has reformed its investment legislation. Let me, <clears throat> for instance, Throughout the last decade, Turkey has been implementing an active policy, active policy to improve its investment environment. To this end, Turkey enacted a new foreign direct investment law in 2003, which was one of the first installments of the significant economic reforms to change the investment environment in Turkey and make it attractive to global investors as well as the local investors. This law guaranteed equal treatment to all investors without differentiating between local and foreign investors and enable all foreign investors to enter Turkey without a preliminary authorization or request to transfer dividends freely, to access real estate and to be protected against expropriation and to hire expatriates. Well, another milestone change that was Turkey also decreased the corporate tax from 33% to 20% for all companies. Important parameters such as the acceptance of the international arbitration courts and ongoing harmonization of the laws with the EU legislation have made Turkey one of the most liberal countries in the world, both in terms of legal framework for FDI and the investment environment. Ladies and gentlemen, encourage private, encouraging the private sector and supported foreign investors have turned Turkey into an economic regional player over the past decade. During this time, the Turkish economy has been growing with an average annual real GDP growth 5%. According to the national income, more than tripled, and GDP per capita exceeded $10,000, up, <coughs> up from $3,500 in 2002. As a result, the economic power of Turkey has drastically increased in the past decade. Turkey became 16th largest economy in the world and 16th largest as compared to 28 EU countries in terms of GDP at purchasing power parity in 2012. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, after such striking economic achievements under the visionary leadership of the Prime Minister, His Excellency Erdogan, Turkey has embarked on a new vision for 2023, which is the sentimental celebration for the foundation of the Republic of Turkey. Specific targets have been set to achieve by 2023. These targets span from the health to economy, from defense to education. Turkey targets to be one of the top 10 economies of the world with the GDP of $2 trillion and to increase its export to $500 billion and to upgrade countries' energy, transportation, education, and health infrastructure. I think this is a challenging job to do. Well, the country's strong economic performance over the past decade has encouraged the experts and international institutions to make confident projections about the future of the Turkish economy. Our country has already been associated with the economic powerhouses of the BRIC and the other emerging markets. So Turkey, with a clear EU agenda and a strong regional position, is playing an increasingly important role in its surrounding area and beyond. Turkey is an active member of G20, is also a member of NATO, Council of Europe, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, IMF and World Bank. And such a country with versatile political assets and economic advantages has positioned itself very well in the region, especially with regard to economic relations. 
For example, over the past decade, Turkey's export to near and the Middle East has increased by more than tenfold and exceeding $42 billion in 2012, up from $3.5 billion only in 2002. I think this is a tremendous development as well, increase in terms of increasing relationship and economic activities in the region. On the other hand, the EU is the largest partner of Turkey, trade partner of Turkey. A similar example can be observed at country level, while on the one hand, Germany, France, Russia, UK, and China are the largest partner, trade partner of Turkey. But right now, very easily we can count among top three, the Iraq. And the Iraq became one of the most important uh, trade partner of Turkey in the last few years. So as we can see from the facts on the ground, Turkey does not consider Middle East as an alternative to EU, vice versa. Turkey does not consider Middle East as an alternative to EU, but Turkey is European as much as the Middle Eastern. So likewise, it is the Middle Eastern as much as it's European. So this is a unique advantage that many countries would like to have. Far-sighted investors had seen this advantage a long time ago, and therefore they have been flocking to Turkey, investing billions of dollars in Turkey to access markets in the region. So it's unique advantage enabling American and other global companies to use Turkey as a hub for their regional headquarters. So today, many global companies, even more than 60 multinationals, they have their regional operations and they are managing these regional operations from Turkey and using Turkey as a hub. For example, PepsiCo, Procter & Gamble, Citibank, Coca-Cola, and, and so many others, GE Healthcare or Microsoft, they're all using Turkey as a hub and the center of their regional operations. By the way, also Turkey is turning day by day a regional financial center. But Turkey's aim to make this financial center global financial center. So our ambitious aim to bring Istanbul among top 10 international financial center. So about this goal, we are working a lot and we are just having a lot of dialogues with the financial companies, international investors. So Istanbul is the largest and the most cosmopolitan city in Turkey, by the way, and center of the great majority of manufacturing, services, and financial activities. So that because of this important also characteristics and important role in Turkish economy, and I think Istanbul is a very important candidate to become among top 10 financial centers of the world. Here in the Northern California, at the hotbed of the global information and communication technologies, I would like to also touch shortly on this sector as well. Rapid developments in the ICT sector will also have its reflections in the Turkish ICT industry, which is estimated to be worth of 30 billion by 2023. Turkey holds more than 1% of both global population and economy, yet its share of the global ICT market stands at only 0.75%. So this difference is an indicator for the industry's growth potential in Turkey. According to estimates of recent studies of the ICT sector in Turkey, in 2006, in 2016, the expected spending in ICT subsectors, namely telecommunications, services, devices, IT services, software, or data center systems is expected to be more than $25 billion. So until 2002, there were only two technoparks in Turkey. So today, there are 50 of which 34 are fully operational with the reminder to be completed in the next few years. There continue to be many incentives, support mechanism, and exemptions offered to both companies and academic operating within these technoparks. Thanks to these, Turkey has 2,300 software companies of which 1,060 of them operate in countries' technoparks. Currently, telecommunication services dominates the Turkish ICT market, constituting around 63% of the total industry. So as of 2013, Turkey had almost 68 million mobile phone subscribers, and Turkey spent $3.6 billion in smartphones only in 2013. So up to 23% from the previous year. So as you see, also in the ICT sector, Turkey has a great, great potential. 
I think increasing cooperation and collaboration in the region and making the region also a hub for the technology is one of the, I think, mission of Turkey. And that is why increasing our cooperation and collaboration with also West Coast of the US is also another important issue for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to say that um, in Turkey, the picture is as a whole pink or gray. I have to say that there are some areas of challenges. So we're still working on these challenges as well. So after a tremendous decade, after, after a tremendous 12 years in Turkey, and very consistent, very strong, very balanced growth and rapid growth and industrialization in Turkey, and also democratization hand in hand with the economic growth as well in Turkey, we have still some challenges that we have to focus on as well. Not the failures, but some challenges I have, challenges I have to say. First of all, the current account deficit is still a risk for us. It's a structural risk. And I cannot say today here that in the short term we can solve this issue. But this is a manageable risk for Turkey. This risk is coming from this current account deficit, basically coming from Turkey's energy market, first of all. Turkey, since it's very important and, and growth market, so increasing demand of the power generation and power in Turkey, electricity demand in Turkey, also Turkey has to import this energy. And basically Turkey so much dependent oil and gas. In order to minimize in Turkey's power generation portfolio, the role of the natural gas and dependency of, of Turkey, what we are trying to do is trying to diversify the resources and trying to use much more local resources of Turkey. Basically, in the portfolio right now, um, the, the share of the uh, natural gas almost around 39%, but it was 10 years ago around 48%, 49%. But we have still a long way to go to decrease Turkey's, reduce Turkey's dependency on gas. So trying to increase the role of the renewable energy. So basically, this is also another challenge for us, using much more solar, thermal energy, hydroelectrics in the country, or the wind energy in Turkey is the challenge for us. So we're following very closely every development in the solar energy. And also, we are also trying to improve the ecosystem of manufacturing that technology is in Turkey and trying to make technology transfer for the wind and for the solar energy as well. Our aim is the next decade is to bring the share of the renewable energy in the portfolio to 30%, which is also a challenging and ambitious goal for us in the next decade. But at the same time, using our local coal, local lignite, by using the clean coal technologies, the new technologies also, another thing that we focused on a lot as well in the country. So current takeout deficit structure is basically so much influenced and dominated by energy import of Turkey. But basically, after just changing the power generation portfolio of Turkey, then reducing the dependency, that will just give us so much, um, so much in the long term solution chance. But at the same time, Turkey is so much importing the intermediary goods as well. And lack of some raw materials and lack of some intermediary goods in Turkey, we are trying to attract the missing part of the supply value chain in some specific industries in Turkey based on competitiveness of Turkey. So if we just bring Turkey the missing part of the value chain and trying to attract more multinationals and trying to make also our SME companies Turkish companies to be part of the that supply chain and more regionalize and internationalize them and bring the missing part of the value chain. I think this will also create another situation and decrease the dependency of Turkey in the so much import intensive uh, sectors to our companies' dependency, to decrease their dependency uh, to the outside. So this is about the current account deficit. but. What I have to give you an example, what we did in the last decade for the current account deficit, basically I can give you the public debt ratio and the public debt issue as well. For instance, um, a decade ago, Turkey's public debt, more than 70% of the GDP, above this. And at the same time, two thirds of that public debt based on dollar-based debts. 
So which was also a big risk for Turkey as well a decade ago. What we did in the last decade, we decreased Turkey's public debt proportion to GDP up to 36%. And now, at the same time, well, the portfolio also changed. Either we squeeze it, we decrease it, either we increase also uh, tremendously our GDP as well, then the proportion is now 35%. So Turkey not anymore has a public debt risk. But at the same time, when you analyze that debt, that risk, that debt is right, right now, we don't have any foreign currency-based foreign debt. And these are all Turkish lira. So there's no open position at the same time in the public debt. And now it is not anymore a risk for Turkey. This part a decade ago was the weaknesses of Turkey, but today become the strength of Turkey. Like the solid financial system of Turkey. I think after me, there will be some financial speakers and CEOs in Turkish financial sector. So I think they will give you much better uh, panorama and, and also much better development um, story of Turkey's finance as well. So, but we have another challenge as well. That is the uh, low rate of savings in the country. We have a very young population, the youngest youth population of Europe. Well, I have to say that 50% of the population below 29. Well, maybe Turkey in terms of the demography in the golden age, the golden age of demographic uh, in Turkey is important. But at the same time, this is not only always advantage, but there are also some disadvantages. One of the disadvantages is this young generation, they'd like to consume, they'd like to spend, they don't want to save. Well, so what we have to do is exactly to teach that young generation uh, the saving as well. What we are trying to do in the country with the lucrative incentive schema, we're trying to increase also the savings in the country, but still this is a challenge for us. So basically, uh, for the pension system, for the pension fund, the government is supporting 25%. Um, if you spend $100, then the government gives you 25% just to support also at the same time the, um, the uh, pension fund system. Now we have more than 3.5 million uh, members actually in the pension fund and dramatically increasing the numbers will affect I think long-term funding of Turkey and the savings of Turkey as well. We have some other also precautions as well but I don't want to count one by one and take your time a lot here. Another challenge of Turkey I have to talk about as well is the Kurdish peace process. And only a week ago, Mr. Prime Minister Excellency Erdogan also announced a new democratization package. And in the new democratization package addressed so much the Kurdish issue as well. And I think the democratization process of Turkey is one of the best thing Turkey ever had in the last decade, I think. But after this, we have another challenge. This is the civilian constitution challenge is still ahead of us. So we're working on this in the parliament with all the political parties right now, uh, has a compromise in most of the articles and the issues about it. So out of this, I have to talk about also another issue. Well, having only 10, 12 years robust economic development is not enough for a country to become advanced economy or advanced democracy. So we know that it should be, cons it should be also consistently two, three decades. So the other challenge is to have that growth and democratization more solid more sustainable, more strong, and more balanced. So we are working on this very well, and we are working on this very much, and I think that this is also another challenge for us, because just before the crisis, before this world financial and economic, economic crisis, the rule of the game was different, and today is totally different. Only trying to maximize your export market will not be a key driver for your economy, for your economic growth. So you have to learn to increase the efficiency in your economy as well. You have to use also domestic resources also very smartly as well. You have to be also, you have to have also a conducive, transparent and predictable investment environment for the investors just to support economic development of the country. Yes, we attracted more than $125 billion foreign direct investment, but right now all the countries competing with each other to attract more FDI. But at the same time, we have to see another challenge because the 
investment appetite of the corporate America or the multinationals or the most important investors of the world not so high. And even the confidence among the, that corporate America is less than the uh, citizens, is less than the households. So this affects actually investment appetite a lot. In this challenging environment, trying to attract more foreign direct investment to Turkey is also another challenge for us. And basically, not only in terms of the quantity basis, but at the same time, quality basis investment attraction is also another challenge for us. Me and my team in the agency working a lot and cooperating with also our ministries and our government as well as the private sector. And we are trying to increase also the quality of the portfolio as well. To attract much more high-tech industries to Turkey is also another mission, another target for us. Right now, the FTI is the 2% of our GDP. But in order to have a better long-term finance of the Turkish economy, obviously we have to bring it to 3-4% of the GDP. But in this turbulent world, it is not easy, it is a challenge. So we are working to have much more conducive, predictable and transparent investment environment. I think this is a permanent job for all countries. You cannot say that I, I have realized very serious structural reforms. I don't want to go further. When you say this, then the other countries from your back will come and pass you and you will just you will not be just in a competitive country for the for the investors. So that's why we know this hard job and working a lot to improve the investment climate and working very closely with the international investors. For instance, in International Investors Consultancy Council, um, they're always getting together annually with the Prime Minister and the top CEOs of the top companies of the world. Once a year, they're having also very important meetings with the Prime Minister, which will be held on at the end of the month in Turkey, and will again listen and learn from the investors. My agency, basically my colleagues, either here, my West Coast advisor, my East Coast advisor, they're all very much trying to be a reference point for all international companies who would like to learn much more the Turkey, Turkey and the also opportunities in Turkey. Basically, Turkey sincerely wants to share her experiences and know-how with the countries in the same region. As the Investment Support and Promotion Agency of Turkey, we believe, we believe in the power of sharing and developing as a region. So far, we have listed several workshops in the agencies of our region to help them during their establishment and development process. We have always said, and I'm here repeating again, our invitation to our neighbors, offering our hand for sharing our experiences. Today, our agency of Turkey holds the vice presidency of the World Association of Investment Promotion Agencies, which acts as a forum for cooperation and exchange of best practices for the promotion and development investments. Within these organizations, we are actively cooperating and sharing our experiences with other countries' investment promotion agencies. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, before, before I end my remarks here, I thank you very much for your kind invitation and your patience. I hope this gathering take us a further step and enable us to succeed in our efforts to peace and prosperity to the Middle East. Thank you very much.